Hello everyone, I'm Rudy Lombard from Blue Creek Capital Management and today we're going to be talking about investing in energy commodities. Quickly before we start we're just going to run through a quick legal disclosure and then jump into what's on the menu for today. Futures trading involves a substantial risk of loss and may not be suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should carefully consider whether such trading is suitable for you in light of your financial condition. In considering whether to authorize Blue Creek Capital Management to trade for you, you should read our disclosure document. The following information reflects our good faith judgment at a specific time and is subject to change without notice. All right, so let's jump straight into what we're going to be looking at today. Just a brief introduction of myself and my history in the commodities trading markets. Look at the different markets that the Energy Alpha Fund trades, some performance and objectives, overview and process, how we dissect the markets and look for trade ideas. I run through a simple trade example, the team that's behind our effort, and then ending off with some Q and A's at the end. So I'm, I'm Rudy Lombard, I'm the head trader at uh, Blue Creek Capital Management and um, for the Energy Alpha portfolio. I started my career about eight years ago uh, at JP Morgan on the commodities trading desk as an analyst. I was working there for about a year when the Dodd-Frank laws came into play and they wanted to stop banks from speculating on commodity prices. So JP Morgan sold their energy trading desk to Mercuria, which is a private Swiss company. I was there for uh, about six years on the crude oil trading desk and traded uh, physical and financial crude across uh, North America and um, into Europe and Asia, uh, based in Calgary, Canada. And then after I left there, I started the fund with um, my colleagues, Bill and Adam, and a couple others that I'll be mentioning in this presentation. What we trade in the Energy Alpha portfolio are energy commodities, as well as currencies. And the currencies that I trade are mainly connected to my commodity view in some way. So most of those positions will be Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, or something um, versus a US dollar, if there's a, a view on that. So what we try and do is we try and provide positive returns on a lower risk adjusted basis. So our aim for the Energy Alpha Fund is not to go and swing for the fences, but rather to take calculated risks and to hit singles throughout the year. And when looking back on the year, that would hopefully add up to a couple of runs on the board. Um, our goal at the beginning of the year is to return 9% or north of that, giving the client the option to utilize leverage if they wish to do so. The, the fund specifically would, would fit in well with the client's portfolio as the energy portfolio and the assets that we trade in this book uh, are non-traditional and uncorrelated to your normal asset classes where when most people start to make a bit of money, they buy a primary home and invest in shares in the S&P 500 and where the energy markets are uncorrelated with the S&P 500 and when stocks take a dip, there is a portion of your portfolio which is naturally hedged against that. And then the energy alpha portfolio aims to make positive returns where the markets are going up or down, whether WTI or Brent is in a bull or bear market. What we try to do is we try and look for value and translate that into PL for our fund investors. So in terms of analysis and how we go about 
investing in the energy alpha fund is we use a bottom-up approach. So in terms of analysis, I think this comes strongly from my experience and, and history of being a physical oil trader where we would see the flows of the physical oil on the pipelines, on the rail cars, and on the tankers and building out those models um, on, a, on a global scale and seeing those flows from one region to the other and how our price solves for flows. So when there is too much oil in one region and not enough in another region, price will solve so that the oil can flow from one region to the other from where it's long to where it's short. And in a basic term, uh, what we would try to do is we try and map out globally where all the production is taking place, where the demand is, and where we see these discrepancies between oversupply and undersupplied areas. And we get stuck in between that and try to capture locational arbitrages. So based on that, that framework and that mindset, how we begin the analysis on the energy alpha portfolio is to look at regional supply and demand. So we're looking on, on a micro level at, at the production in, in each of the states in the US. We're looking at production in Central South America and um, all the regions globally. Uh, we're looking at the demand, looking at the margins, refinery margins, and um, kind of piecing the puzzle together and, and once we have an idea of supply and demand in each local regional area, we kind of piece all those balances together for your main continents. And then to get that feeds into kind of your global balances um, to get a, a macro view of supply and demand. So I think this last year has been quite a, quite a good example where we've seen um, draws globally. Um, so on a macro level, everything across the energy complex is bullish because we've seen you know one to two million barrels a day of uh, of draws so it's been a uh, good for macro players as they've seen uh, that thesis play out so once we know what the fundamental supply and demand picture looks like we have a better idea of where to start looking for trade ideas so some of the trades we might take are outright directional trades, relative value trades, locational arbitrage trades, and then the vol and skew trades, which is more op options related trades. Touching on the locational arbitrage trades. So as I mentioned, sometimes you'll get too much supply in one area and not enough in, the other, in, a, in another area. And as time goes on, price will correct for this. And so if there's too much oil in the US Gulf Coast and too little oil in Europe or the North Sea, then what will happen is the US Gulf Coast market will price weaker and the North Sea market will price stronger, opening up an arbitrage allowing for that oil to flow. And so we're constantly monitoring the pricing of different regions and looking at that in comparison to what our models are saying and trying to capture those locational arbitrage movements um, as we forecast those plays to kind of play out. And if they do play out accordingly, then price will correct between two locations and um, we'll have been able to trade that view. So once we know what the supply and demand picture is telling us for on, a, on a fundamental side, we also take into account macro factors and trends. Um, what is OPEC doing? Uh, what are governments saying? What are central banks saying? What's the macro picture? What do we expect the dollar to do? And uh, what do we expect in terms of regulations or supply increases from OPEC or the rest of the world or you know, embargoes or any of these thing, type, types of things? And we factor that into our kind of risk reward analysis and then we go about making decisions. So depending on the market conditions and what opportunities are present in the market, we'll decide to take a position with futures contracts 
or with options contracts. With futures contracts, it will be um, more relative value or locational arbitrage based trades. So it will be WTI versus Brent or um, US Gulf Coast oil versus a North Sea grade and trying to capture the arbitrage between um, two very similar instruments in two different locations. And the options contracts, um, if we see something in the vol or skew market, where vol is very cheap or uh, vol is expensive, or the skew favors the put or call side, we structure trades accordingly for asymmetrical risk reward payoffs um, with high probability win rates based on what we're seeing in um, the fundamental supply and demand kind of picture. So if the market in if the options market is offering us a two to one kind of um, PL opportunity where we can risk 1% to make 2% and it aligns with our view that oil will continue to increase, then that's a trade that we'll look at taking. It's nice because it's limited risk. We're only risking a maximum of 1% in order to make 2%, but it's got you know, a decent probability win rate because it aligns with what we're seeing in the physical flows market. And um, that is that is a kind of trade that we will that we will be interested in stalking. So this, this is um, just the layout of kind of the building blocks of what I've just discussed and how kind of we go about making decisions um, and how we go about choosing which trades to take. Um, so this is mapped out um, what I've touched on in the previous slide. So I thought in order to explain kind of these things that I've been talking about in a practical sense, I thought I'd go through a, a, a simple example um, to highlight um, the kind of trade that we'd look at. This is, I've tried to, distill it down to something as simple as possible um, so that um, it can hopefully add value to a, a novice or someone that's um, been in the industry um, in the commodities world for, for quite a while. So looking at, I've, I've decided to take some public, uh, use some, some public data here. Uh, and not any proprietary data, I think it'll be easier to explain. And it's something that anyone watching this can go and can go and look at themselves. It's from the short-term energy outlook of the um, EIA, the energy department in the US. So if we look at the supply and demand balance for the crude oil markets in the US, we've seen considerable draws over the last 18 months, um, we saw we saw um, supply and demand, or yeah, we saw the balances hit um, up to the, the five year highs when when COVID hit, and ever since then, we've been ratcheting downwards. Um, now we're in a place where we're close to the five year lows average, looking on, on a five year look back period, and now we're going to start to see small builds in Q4, according to EIA, followed by bigger builds in Q1 for the US. And if we look at the global market, according to what the EIA has um, mapped out in their models, you can see the dotted line is where kind of that was the end of Q2, and then they forecasted from, from there forward they're still seeing Q3 and Q4 global draws with things then flattening out in 2022 onwards. So if we look in the US, the, the forecast was that we'd see small draws followed, I mean, sorry, small builds followed by slightly bigger builds in, in Q1. And then on a global scale, we're seeing draws continue in Q3 and 4 and then a, a balanced market in Q1 next year. So just on a very elementary level, if what the EIA is saying is correct, then there'll be some 
crude stock builds in the US. And we even started to see those numbers in the last two weeks of data coming out of the, the weekly EIA reports. We've seen small builds starting to materialize, but globally we're still seeing draws, which will continue, albeit get a bit smaller into the end of the year. So what, what should happen and what has already happened is that the WTI Brent or what I call it, or the spread between WTI and Brent will widen, which will then open up the export arbitrage between the US and global markets. So you can see through summer, so I'm, I'm just using the December 21 contract as an example here, which is um, fairly close to the front month. So it's, it's currently um, where kind of the the prompt spread is trading at around $4. And um, WTI versus Brent has, through summer, it was strong. And then steadily, as we've come into the, coming to Q4, it's, it's widened out to $4 as that thesis is playing out that the, that the EIA has been highlighting where we get a slowdown in crude draws in the US which then flatten and become, you know, seasonally small builds while the rest of the world is still, still drawing. So what has to happen if you have a surplus of crude in the US and a shortage globally, price will compensate for that and allow those export barrels to flow. So your marginal players in the export space will be able to buy the US crude in the Gulf Coast and sell it globally on a Brent basis, locking in, an, locking in a spread. So in order for those barrels to flow, price has to incentivize players to buy the US crude and then sell it globally. And the only time they're gonna step into the market to do that is when there's an open arbitrage between two locations. So, if we've seen the front month contract or the December contract already start compensating for what we're starting to see in the market, where's maybe a simple trade from here? So this is just December contract. If we look at the WTI brain forward curve, so if we take December 21 contract, which is the, um, the first bullet, and we look further down the futures curve of the WTI brain spread, You'll see, for example, that I've I've just charted out the the three ninety nine or four dollar mark for the December contract, and then a, a three seventy six mark for the Jan contract. So you can see there's about a twenty three twenty four cent discount for the Jan ARB versus the December ARB. And if what is currently happening in the market continues to happen, we will see the roll down effect. So we'll see. Uh, as we approach expiry for the December futures contract for WTI Brent, we'll see the Jan contract roll down to a number close to where the December contract expires. And if there's still a surplus in the US versus a shortage globally, then we're gonna see price compensate for that. Jan will roll down to closer to the minus $4 mark It'll open up the pricing location arbitrage and it'll allow for participants to lock in that spread and move the oil from where there's a surplus to where there's a shortage. So this is a simple example of how we go about looking um, for opportunities in the market um, and to capitalize on what we're seeing in terms of physical flows and then a broader supply and demand picture um, in the global crude oil market. I instruments that we trade in the Blue Creek Energy Alpha book um, is the WTI crude oil contract, Brent crude oil, natural gas, heating oil, uh, gasoline, and then US grades. Um, we currently doing the HTT grade because it's the most liquid grade. That is basically, um, it's the financial contract for um, Magellan East Houston or WTI 
in the Gulf Coast. So if you're trading the export ARB, it's nice to incorporate the actual physical barrel that's sitting in the Gulf Coast. You 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 capture that that pricing into your calculations and you can trade it as well. Um, then looking at currencies, you do all the majors, um, but like I said, mostly it will be Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, as it's closely linked to commodities. In terms of the fund, invest, investment minimums are $25,000 blocks, but because we can use leverage, the minimum emotional value would be 12 and a half thousand, which will allow for a 2X leverage in the fund. So this is a service um, that we offer as well. And if investors want to take more risk, um, they can do so if it suits their investment portfolio. Like I mentioned earlier in the Energy Alpha Fund, we, we really try and provide steady returns with with minimum drawdown, and we try and hit that nine or north of 9% target um, for the year with as little drawdown as possible. And onto the team that, that manages the fund, um, we have cumulatively over, well over 50 years of experience in the futures and options and commodity industry. So, it's a big team behind this effort and um, a very professional outfit that makes sure that everything from the front office trading to the operations, to the settlement, um, to the communication with clients is, is done professionally. And um, we take our fiduciary responsibility very seriously to provide a product um, that, that, that works for our clients. Um, Bill is one of the founders of um, um, he, he's one of the, the founders of Blue Creek Capital. He's our president and CEO. Previously, uh, he was also founder of Blue Line Futures, and um, he's been in the industry since 2007. You'll probably see him as a familiar face as he's on TV every other day on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox, etc. with some trade ideas and some insights for um, market participants. Adam Webb is our president and CIO. He's had a very long career, especially in the electronic market making um, side of things where he was at Goldman Sachs for uh, many years and, and um, headed up their exotic derivatives desk in Asia before founding a couple of um, projects and startups himself, which he um, successfully built and sold, and uh, now is a part of the uh, Blue Creek Capital Management um, team as well, and um, provides a lot of guidance and um, investment analysis. We have uh, Oliver Soup and Philip Stribel, who are managing directors. Um, Oliver's got over 10 years' experience, and Philip over 18 years. They also could be familiar faces um, where they are also featured regularly on, on TV and giving their views in, in, a, whole, in a whole lot of, of futures markets, not just the energy markets, but there's a whole host of, of markets that they're involved in. And uh, I believe um, one of them, they'll be presenting um, I think in one of the slots as well. So look forward to hearing from them as well. So we are based in Chicago. Our email address is info at bluecreek.capital. Please get in touch if you do have any questions. Um, we'd be very happy to answer any of them. And then I thought I'd leave a couple minutes at the end for any questions. If anyone did have, I'd be um, happy to, to answer any of them. I know there might have been a little bit of Jargon, especially in uh, in terms of um, the crude oil language that I might have dropped. So, if there are any questions, um, please ask or we'll leave a chat. I'll be happy to to share further. Okay. 
Yes, I see a question here. Um, thank you for that. What kind of management fees are charged? So we charge a one in 17 fee structure. So 1% management fee and 17% um, performance fee. The next question is crude going up or down till year's end? So good question. So I think we've seen the bull run. I am still bullish crude and commodities, but um, I think it, uh, it won't have the legs um, that we've seen from it in the last couple of months going forward. I don't think we're gonna just extrapolate price um, out of the Q4 and, uh, and uh, end you know, $20, $30 higher than, than where we are now. I do still see upside, but I do think it's limited um, with, with builds coming in with a lot of excess crude that OPEC is, is holding back. Um, I think we start to see a bit of a slow in a more balanced market kind of towards the end of the year and then into Q1. So am I bullish Q4? Yes, indeed. Am I chomping at the bit to get long Cal 22 futures? Um, I more look at, you know, a, an iron condor or a call spread with some, with some upside potential more than I would um, be going, you know, all in on um, this rally just continuing at this pace. Uh, can you share some performance metrics over the past few years? Sure. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me go back to slide number five here. So it's a new fund. We are a uh, startup fund, um, and we're almost a year old. So I've just shown our 2021 performance here. We are up. Um, close on 7%. So kind of want to keep that going and break through that 9% goal of ours um, and um, keep keep hitting keep hitting singles into year end and then uh, keep that keep that going into the new year. So um, we only have this this one year of um, performance metrics, but uh, our we're we're trying to reach our goals this year and we'll build on that for next year and um, keep building the track record and keep doing what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> we have a solid game plan laid out. We have a solid team. We have solid fundamentals and research um, and many years of experience that we're putting behind this um, to reach that goal of 9% without the big drawdowns and then giving the client the the choice whether he wants to use leverage or not, that's completely up to him uh, if, uh, if that's suitable for his portfolio. But we want to provide those steady returns um, in an asset class that is not correlated to the S&P 500. And on top of that, we our, our aim is to is to make money, whether it's an up, up or down market um, and taking opportunities that the market presents us um, as and that's an ever dynamic thing, but we try and position ourselves to have asymmetrical risk reward positions and and have that play out over time. So we're not we're not day trading. We have very thought out, um, calculated trades, and we allow those to play out over a two or three month time horizon. So. Just touching on that as well, we, you know, the fund is is almost a year old, but um, we all have experience um, for many years and great track records um, in in previous endeavors and companies, and we're leveraging all of that to provide this product and service to to investors at the moment. Yeah. 
are there any more questions? If there's no more questions uh, in the next 10 seconds or so, I'll uh, hand over to David.